Now, um, without further ado, I would like to introduce our first speaker for the evening, uh, Daryl Rangier, SC. Uh, Daryl was a barrister at the private bar in Queensland since 1991. He was the chair of the Queensland Fisheries Tribunal from 2000 to 2009 and a member of the Queensland Anti-Discrimination Tribunal from 2004 to 2009. Daryl was appointed uh, Senior Counsel for the State of Queensland in 2008 and would you please give a big warm welcome to Daryl Rangia. Um, and uh, but he paid a bribe in Indonesia 
and he was able to get a passage on another boat and sail to Australia again. He paid a total of about $16,000 for the, the journey. Uh, the boat was intercepted on its way to Australia and he was taken to Christmas Island and he was detained there. Now, Christmas Island is a territory of Australia, but it, it's nowhere near Australia, really. Um, it's not close to the mainland. It's some 2,600 kilometres northwest of Perth. Um, however, it's only 500 kilometres um, south of Indonesia. Uh, apparently, the United Kingdom transferred sovereignty to Australia in 1957 because um, Australia was after the, the phosphate deposits there. Um, now, it's important though for, to realise that it's part of Australia. Now, again, for those of you who are not familiar with migration law, a, a visa is um, a permission to enter and remain in Australia. Uh, and under the Migration Act, it's uh, the job of the minister or the power of the minister to grant visas. And often that can be done either through the minister or someone who he delegates the power to. Um, Section 31 of the Migration Act provides that one class of visa that can be granted is a protection visa. Um, a criterion for the grant of a protection visa is that the applicant must be a non-citizen in Australia, in respect of whom the minister is satisfied that Australia owes protection obligations under the Refugees Convention as amended by the Refugees Protocol. Now, what that requires is that the person, owing to a well-founded fear of being persecuted for reasons of race, uh, religion, nationality, membership of a particular social group or political opinion, is outside the country of his or her nationality and is unable or owing to such fear is unwilling to avail himself or herself of the protection of country. Um, so that's the definition of refugee in the, um, in the convention and that's the criterion upon which um, grant protection visa to a person is based. Now section 36 of the Migration Act requires that the person applying for a protection visa be in Australia. Now very often you'll have people who come to Australia on a valid visa, say a tourist visa or a student visa, and then while they're in Australia they'll make an application for protection visa. But the position is, is quite different where a person arrives in Christmas, on Christmas Island uh, by a boat uh, without a visa. And it's different um, as a result of a series of amendments to the Migration Act which started as part of the Howard government's uh, Pacific Solution. Um, now, under the Act, Christmas Island is what is called an excised offshore place. Um, and what that means is that it's not part of the migration zone for Australia. It's excised as part of the migration zone for Australia, even though it's part of Australia. Um, and the plaintiff in this case, um, or the applicant, SZQRB, was what is known as an offshore entry person. Um, the, the, in some political circles, such a person is described as an illegal, but the uh, Migration Act uses slightly uh, nicer language, it's an offshore entry person. Um, under Section 46, capital A of the Migration Act, um, SZQRB was unable to make a valid application for a protection visa. Um, and because he didn't have a visa, then under the Migration Act, he had to be detained in immigration detention centre, in an immigration detention centre, until he was removed from Australia. Um, so he was placed in immigration detention then on Christmas Island. Now, I, I haven't uh, got the time to explain the torturous procedural and legislative scheme by which events unfolded, but perhaps it's sufficient for me to say that under Section 195 capital A of the Migration Act, uh, the Minister, on his own motion, exercised the power to grant SZQRB a temporary safe haven visa and then a bridging visa, uh, which expired on the 28th of August 2012. Now, when the bridging visa expired, uh, he no longer had a visa, so he was what's called an unlawful non-citizen. 
and it meant that he had to be taken back into detention and then had to be removed from Australia. Um, however, what he did was he applied for an injunction to restrain the minister from removing him from Australia and the ground for that was that the um, minister had acted unlawfully when making a decision, which I'll come to. And um, so it was this claim that was the subject of consideration then, ultimately by the full court of the federal court. Uh, now at this stage I do have to explain a little bit more about the legislative scheme. Section 91 capital K has the effect that a person who holds a temporary safe haven visa um, cannot apply for a protection visa. Um, so that is, they are prevented from even making an application on the basis that they're a refugee and Australia owes them protective, uh, protection um, obligations. However, under section 91L, if the minister thinks it's in the public interest, the minister may allow the non-citizen to apply for a protection visa. Um, but importantly for present purposes, section 91L also says that the minister does not have a duty to consider whether to exercise the power to allow, it, to allow the non-citizen to apply for a protection visa. I might just explain that again because it's a bit of a mouthful, but, um, but it's important to understand what this case is all about. So, if, you're, um, if you've got a temporary safe haven visa, you can't apply for a protection visa, but the minister can let you apply for a protection visa if he thinks it's in the public interest. However, the minister doesn't have a duty or an obligation uh, to consider whether to let you apply for a, um, a, a protection visa. Now, the reason for this convolution and contortion in the Act, rather than just saying the Minister may, uh, you may apply for a protection visa and the Minister may grant it or refuse it, the reason why this is convoluted and contorted provision is that uh, it's an attempt to avoid judicial review by our courts. Because once the Minister makes a, de a decision to, re to refuse a visa, then um, there is an inviolable power in the High Court under Section 75, Subsection 5 of the Constitution to review that decision. And if it contains a jurisdictional error of law, then the High Court can overturn that decision. And so what this is an attempt to do is to say, well, the minister doesn't have to make any decision. And so the minister says, well, I'm not, I, refuse to, uh, I refuse to consider whether or not to make a decision. And so therefore I haven't made a decision and there's nothing to review. And so effectively the minister makes a decision which is not a decision and no one can challenge it anyway. <laughs> so... Um, now, I think that every lawyer, every law student should read a book called The Trial by, by Kafka, yes. if you haven't already. And um, this provision is disturbingly Kafka-esque. Um, now, so I've said that a person in the position of um, the plaintiff here, in this case, um, can't apply for a protection visa. But what there is, is a system um, where someone called an independent merits reviewer can make a recommendation as to whether the um, person should be recognised as uh, a refugee, to use the, the shorthand. Um, and the minister can consider the recommendation made by the um, made by the um, independent merits reviewer and then the minister can then say, well, I, I will let you make an application for a protection visa, and then the application is made, and then the minister decides it. Now, at this stage, um, it's necessary for me to mention a decision of the High Court in, uh, called Plaintiff M61. In that case, the High Court looked at similar provisions in Section 46, Capital A, and Section 195A 
which also contain non-compellable powers for the minister to consider allowing people to make applications for protection visas and so forth. Uh, the High Court said that the exercise of the minister's power under these provisions involved two distinct steps. The first step is that the minister um, it involves a decision to consider exercising the power to lift the bar so that the person, so as to allow the making of an application for a reputation visa. And the second step in the decision making process is to actually allow the application to be made. The High Court also said that allowing the procedure of an independent merits review uh, to investigate the case uh, means that the Minister has taken the first of those steps in respect of all the persons to whom it applies. So that is, um, the Minister considers the exercise of the power to lift the bar. The High Court also said, though, that the Independent Merits Review um, must be procedurally fair. Uh, procedural fairness is another uh, name for natural justice. So part of that is, for example, is the hearing rule under common law. Um, a person must be given a fair hearing, and must be given a chance to address material that is adverse to the person uh, if a lawful decision is to be made. And the independent review, a merits reviewer must also address the correct legal questions. In M61, the High Court said that the independent merits review was conducted without giving procedural fairness or natural justice and was also conducted on the basis of an error of law. Um, then the High Court had to consider whether relief was available against the Minister. Now, the problem was that the remedy of mandamus was not available. Uh, mandamus involves um, the demonstration of a jurisdictional error of law and then the court making an order that someone make a decision again. But the court said that there was no duty in the Minister to, um, to embark on the second step, maybe namely to make a decision as to whether to lift the bar to allow someone to make a protection visa. So the Minister couldn't be compelled to make a decision, even if um, the merits review um, was legally flawed. Um, and then because mandamus was unavailable, there was no utility in granting certiorari to quash um, the recommendation which the Independence Merits Review had made. However, the High Court held that a declaration was available, so the Court could declare that the process which led to the Independent Merits Review was flawed. Um, and so while the Minister couldn't be compelled to do anything, the Court could make a declaration. And it would be um, highly unusual, um, almost unheard of, possibly unheard of altogether, for a Minister not to act upon a declaration made by the High Court. Now, um, in this case that we're dealing with now, um, in SQ, SZQRB, the Minister sought to overcome the power of the Court to make a declaration um, in that M61 case by not making one decision but making two decisions. Um, the first decision was that SZQRB's return to Afghanistan was consistent with Australia's international obligations. So in other words, he was not a refugee within the Convention. Um, and it was based on an acceptance of the recommendation uh, made in an assessment by, uh, which was called the International Treaties Obligation Assessment, or ITOA. Um, but also anticipating that if the ITOA recommendation um, could be challenged as a result of the M61 decision, the Minister then tried to be really tricky and made a second decision. And the second decision was that even if the assessment, the ITOA, contained some factual legal error, then the Minister would not consider the power to lift the bar and to allow an application for a protection visa to be made. And this is particularly egregious because what the Minister was saying was it doesn't matter what the true facts of the case are, and it doesn't matter how wrong the assessment was, factually or legally, he wasn't going to change his mind, so there was no point in the court making a declaration that the assessment was, was unlawful or wrong. Um, 
Disturbingly, I think, in the um, appeal, the minister submitted that he was entitled to decide never to exercise the discretion or, uh, or the power conferred under Section 91L, that is to lift the bar to make, allow someone to make a protection application for a protection visa, irrespective of the facts and circumstances prevailing in a particular country, and even in the face of um, uh, acceptance of the likelihood of torture or, or, or other persecution. So in other words, the minister was saying, look, I don't have to consider, I don't have to make any decision whether I'm going to allow the person to apply for a protection visa. And it doesn't matter if the independent assessment of the independent merits review got completely wrong, I'm still not going to change my mind. So telling the courts, don't bother making any declaration because it's not going to affect anything. Uh, now, but what the court did here to get over this issue was it applied a decision in a, um, of the, in a case called M70, which is another decision of the um, High Court, to conclude that SZQRB could not be removed from Australia uh, under the powers given under Section 198 of the Act until his claim to be entitled to protection under Australian, Australia's international obligations had been assessed. But, they could only, but the type of assessment that's required is one that is done according to law. So if there was an error of law, in this case, misinterpreting the standard of proof that was required or um, not giving someone natural justice, then there hadn't been an assessment of his claim for protection according to law. And he couldn't be removed from Australia until uh, that process had been done. So the court said, well, look, we can't, tell, we can't force the minister to make a decision one way or another or to even consider the exercise of the power. But um, as long as a decision remains unmade, According to law, you can't take him out of the country. Um, so, what the court did here was it made a declaration um, that uh, the um, made a declaration that there were errors um, made in the assessment relied on by the minister, and it said that if the minister attempted to move, remove him from the country, then it would grant him an, um, an injunction to prevent that from happening. And it also raised, um, and I think this is particularly going to be worrying for the Minister, it raised the possibility that someone's uh, detention may be unlawful uh, in certain circumstances um, if there's no genuine consideration of, uh, or no genuine independent um, assessment. And the issue about um, unlawful detention means that the person then has the potential action for false imprisonment and damages against the, um, the government. Um, now, that was essentially what the majority decided, or, well, four, four out of the five judges decided. They decided the case on the basis that I've just outlined. But perhaps the most interesting um, aspect of the case was the judgment of Justice Flick. Um, um, His Honour concluded that it was not open to the Minister to decline to consider whether to lift the bar, irrespective of any factual legal errors in the assessment, in the independence merits assessment. Um, what, he, what His Honour said that it was illogical for the Minister to say, uh, oh, I've taken into account the assessment that's been made, but even if that assessment is wrong, it's not going to it's flawed legally or factually. Even if it's wrong, I'm not going to change my mind about it. Um, so he said that was making a decision that was akin to acting on a personal whim. Uh, it was arbitrary and uh, it was invalid for, for that reason. And Justice Flick, of course, is recognised as one of the leading authorities on administrative law in um, Australia. So it was a particularly um, interesting decision because there are few um, administrative law decisions that say that a decision um, that has been made by a minister is um, uh, arbitrary or capricious. Now, um, I suspect that I may have gone longer than I was allotted, and um, I'll leave it perhaps to others and to, for a general discussion <coughs> to, uh, about the consequences uh, of the uh, decision, but um, for the time being, that um, is essentially what the case decided. It is a very important decision um, for Australian jurisprudence.
Darrell for a very important analysis of an incredibly disturbing case. I certainly recommend everyone to read the case. Um, if, you, if you're not familiar with migration law or just becoming familiar, it does give a great um, summary of a number of the recent High Court judgments that have got the Minister in um, consistent trouble with not following his own laws. And um, certainly Australian lawyers for human rights concerned with Australia adhering to its obligations under various conventions, including the Convention Against Torture, the International Convention on Civil Political Rights, and the Refugee Convention as amended by the Protocol. The fact, I, I mean, it's quite baffling that they introduce these international treaties obligation assessments and then just use these unfettered discretions and um, non-compellable powers to then say, well, we're going to refoul this person regardless of whether the court finds that our um, decision-making process is unlawful. And, um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's as disturbing reading as viewing if you happened to see Four Corners last night. And um, if you didn't, I, I also encourage you to have a look at that. Um, Stephen Kime would love me to say, check out the ALHR Facebook page and like it, because he's um, now our former president, but he's still absolutely um, uh, swept away with social media and loves dumping the contents of his <laughs> inbox into um, Facebook every morning. Um, and I've actually... Um, it, kind of propelled forth by uh, th this quite amazing judge by the full court and, and including Justice Flick, um, one of the uh, notable headings in his judgment is uh, disturbing undercurrents. Um, you know, it's, it, it's not that usual that you find such kind of express um, disdain with the, with the minister's conduct and certainly submissions put by uh, counsel for the minister. So um, there will be a question and answer at the end and um, I um, would now like to introduce our second distinguished speaker, uh, Sonia Caton, who is a solicitor and migration agent and also the chairwoman of the Refugee Council of Australia. She's been working in the area for about 20 years and um, started off as a criminal lawyer, um, but prompted by injustices being perpetrated upon asylum seekers under the coalition government, she returned to the Refugee um, and Immigration Legal Service, or RAILS, um, and some there'll be some volunteers in the audience, no doubt, becoming its director and principal solicitor, and the service was awarded a National Human Rights Award under her leadership. Sonia now chairs the council. Uh, she's a consultant to a number of organisations working with asylum seekers and was integral to the successful launch of the Community Placement Network, a scheme by which asylum seekers are placed in Australian homes. Um, she's also on several other boards and government advisory committees and has worked in detention centres on Christmas Island and elsewhere. She lectures in administrative law and contributes to legal texts. Uh, Sonia has just recently returned from Afghanistan and Turkey uh, where she inspected conditions of refugees and returnees in camps and urban situations. Would you please uh, join me in giving her a warm round? Um, there's so many of you here, that's just great. Um, very exciting. I just want to um, ask that if there are any journalists in the audience, um, that's fine. But could you please, I'm speaking on behalf of the Refugee Council tonight, and we had a situation last week where a journalist misrepresented our position quite profoundly, um, with global consequences being mentioned in parliaments and the council has been chasing its tail for a week. So if you are a journalist, could you just check your facts with me, please, um, if you're writing for um, a major publication like The Guardian? Um, but if you're not, <laughs> then it might be okay. <laughs> um, so I've just come back from Afghanistan. Why did I go? I went because of the nature of the issues that were at the core of SZQRB. So we had a cohort of asylum seekers that arrived in roughly 2009, early 2010, um, many <coughs> asylum seekers, but we're talking asylum seekers from Afghanistan because at the moment they are the only ones that can be forcibly returned to a country of origin. Iran is not taking forced returns, Iraq is not taking forced returns. If you're a stateless Faili Kurd, for example, from Iran, um, they're not taking returns if you're a failure Kurd from Iraq and you can't prove your citizenship, you can't go back there. If you're Palestinian, nobody wants you. Um, nobody wants refugees full stop, but um, 
there is this memorandum of understanding which is a little bit ambiguous and basically Australia is trying very hard to return failed Afghan asylum seekers um, to make a point to in, in another effort to stop the boats. So we're focusing particularly on Afghanistan, I, I was and, and a lot of other advocates because there are an enormous number of Hazara Shia Hazaras coming out of Quetta which is in Pakistan right next to the border of Afghanistan. A lot of people from Afghanistan has, have gone there as refugees. Um, and they're not Tajiks, they're not Uzbeks, they're not Pashtuns, there are a lot of different types of uh, ethnicities in Afghanistan, only Hazaras, they're the only ones who are Shias. And they're the ones that the, the, the Sunni extremist Taliban elements, um, you know, really uh, uh, persecute and have done for a very long time. So they came out in, in they, they, these were the boats coming out in 2009, came to Christmas Island and there was a processing of suspension. I don't know if any of you remember. And on the 9th of April 2010, the Minister Evans said, right, any of you who are from Afghanistan, you're just going to sit in a detention centre for six months and we're not going to look at your case. And so they moulded in detention um, for that period of time. When they finally started moving into processing, they were subject to this non-statutory offshore construct, which is what you have in place when you say half of Australia is not really Australia for the purposes of the Migration Act, which is everything Daryl's just been talking about, and say, OK, we're going to assess your claims in accordance with this paralegal scheme, and if you have a claim that is proved, then you have to ask the Minister permission to lodge a claim under the Migration Act. And that's what Daryl was referring to, lifting the bar. Anyway, so it was called um, the RSA Refugee... Um, RSA, what does it stand for now? <laughs> that is specific, thank you. Um, and that was basically uh, dealing with Department of Immigration and putting your claims at the primary level. If you failed, you then had the sort of paralegal equivalent of a merits review, like you might get in the Refugee Review Tribunal, and that was called um, the Independent Merits Review. I'm having to check my notes because it's now changed so many times. There's been so many iterations, I'm starting to forget. Then we had, as Daryl alluded to, in November 2010, so only a few months after they've you know, they've had a suspension of processing, they've gone in, starting to drizzle into this first paralegal decision-making framework, you had the High Court saying in M61, M69, guess what? Lots of decisions have been conducted um, in an unlawful manner. People, particularly the Hazaras, they had been relying on this country information which said basically they were experiencing a golden age uh, in terms of centuries of persecution. And they hadn't been putting the specifics to the uh, guys who were claiming protection for them to properly um, reply to. And the same for Sri Lankans. Um, so that prompted um, a bit of a rethink in the Department of Immigration because clearly a lot of people were going to have to have their matters heard again in a lawful manner or else, and many of them did go on to judicial review because that case also found that they had judicial review rights. We won't get to, it's very, if you think it's complicated, you're right. Anyway, so the department went back and, and had a little think and scurried around and said, well, with our caseload now, let's have a little internal look at them um, and see if any of them won't get over the line. So they examined several hundred, um, uh, uh, sorry, uh, about a hundred, and uh, roughly half of them were found in this internal kind of process that no lawyers had any input into and nobody really even knew what was happening, that they qualified for protection. And there was no real explanation as why, for why the others didn't. So that upset a lot of asylum seekers because, oops, out pops out my mate with a protection visa. How did that happen? Um, and this is the kind of arbitrariness that has, has been a real hallmark of all the processing of the offshore arrivals. So that happened in August 2011, and then they, the government, in response to uh, the High Court, you know, giving them a pretty significant smackdown, um, devised another offshore process, 
um, which was called the Independent Protection IPE, Inde IPA, Independent Protection Assessment, and you could appeal that to the IPO, which is the Independent Protection Obligations something. Does anybody remember? The, the idea is it's another paralegal merits review forum, um, which no longer exists. So, at that particular point in time, we had a, an a, 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 a success rate for claims by Hazaras, which had gone from, in 2008-2009, from pretty well 100%, to 77.9% in 2009-2010 and then coinciding with the suspension and then the High Court uh, saying there had been unlawful decision making, whatever, all the guys who are going through now the second iteration of an offshore decision making framework were subjected to several decision makers who were incredibly inconsistent with their decision making compared to the norm and were approving about 3% of applicants, which brought the total average of successful Hazara claims down to 37.7. Absolutely in a, in, in a, in a, a hugely marked um, statistical drop. So you've got to ask questions. Um, what was going on there? Anyway, so you now have this cohort, which has been detained for a long time, been subjected to two sets of offshore decision-making frameworks, highly arbitrary decision-making, um, inconsistent decision-making, I should say, um, and there were some successful judicial reviews uh, showing apprehended bias, um, and they were, we then had the introduction of what's called complementary protection on the uh, 24th of March 2012. So, you have protection, which is the refugee um, convention here, and then in many comparative jurisdictions for quite a long time, there has also been protection under the Convention Against Torture and the Convention on Civil and Political Rights. And what the government did after a lot of lobbying by the Refugee Council, the Uniting Churches and others, and, and I'm talking many, many years of um, lobbying, the government said, okay, we are going to introduce complementary protection because we have signed those conventions and we, we have international obligations um, and so they have put them on equal footing with the uh, refugee convention and now when you apply for refugee status, you, all your claims are assessed number one against the convention. If they don't fit in, they're assessed against the Convention Against Torture and the ICCPR and if you're a child, um, Convention on Rights of the Child. And if you are successful under any of them, you are awarded protection uh, in the same manner you would be as under the Refugee Convention. So nothing is prejudiced or unequal. Protection is protection under all these acts. And so now people who were coming through the system were pulled out of this offshore framework and allowed to have their matters reviewed by the onshore refugee review tribunal and their claims were front end loaded. That means all your facts are there and they're assessed against all the conventions. But not for this cohort who had progressed beyond that point. And they were left to have their claims under the CAT, uh, the Convention Against Torture and the ICCPR under this ITOA, the International Treaties Obligation Assessment, which was a desktop assessment conducted by a bureaucrat in Canberra with no uh, uh, input at all from the asylum seeker. Most of them didn't even know it was happening. And the standard letter they would get back was, uh, your matter didn't meet the guidelines for referral to the minister. And this is when, in quite a significant number of cases, an independent merits reviewer had said, we recommend a visa be granted on humanitarian grounds. So those recommendations previously would have always gone through to the minister. And when I say previously, 
If we go back to people who arrive by plane and they come to Australia and they lodge protection and they fail and they go to the Refugee Review Tribunal, they then could use a section under the Act to ask the minute to grant them a visa in any case on compelling and compassionate grounds and that discretion was also framed to take into account our international obligations under CAP, ICCPR and CROC. So it was non-compellable, it was non-reviewable, um, it had no time limits, Amanda, and so it was a very poor, a monumentally poor way to honour our international obligations. Amanda Vanstone, I don't think, ever lifted a pen. She had stacks of, you know, files asking for the, um, for her to exercise her discretion under Section 417 in this manner. Um, who came after Amanda? Andrews, Kevin Andrews, he was a little bit more active. Then we had Chris Evans, okay. Chris Bowen was an extremely active minister. He would churn through these things, but he also um, presided over a time where to try and stop the boats, he managed to get so many decisions to be require ministerial intervention that I think there are rooms and rooms and rooms of files of issues now requiring ministerial intervention and the current minister um, so far does not seem very active. So people are just left in limbo. So we had a cohort of about 300 Hazaras who had been subject to this desktop review which dealt with really serious claims under conventions that had equal status to the Refugee Convention. The wrong test had been applied and, the, and, and so it's, it's, it's now the real chance test, which is the test that is, is there a real chance of serious harm, blah, 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 as applies under the Refugee Convention. The Refugee Council and others always said that the test that they have under Section 36.2AA, I don't want to, you know, bore you with that, but um, was incredibly convoluted and difficult and invited um, an interpretation of our obligations which was utterly inconsistent with international law when all that jurisprudence went to the same fundamental principle of non refoulement don't return if they're going to be persecute, persecuted. Anyway, they put through this convoluted definition. The full court has now said it's the real chance test. Thank you. Um, so those that have been determined in court as a wrong test have to be redetermined. All of, none of them had natural justice, so they really should, all the matters will be heard again. But what we had was the department picking Hazaras off the street and saying, we're deporting you in three days. And people were rushing off to the Federal Magistrates Court to get injunctions on the basis of SZQRB, saying very similar circumstances. They were getting the injunctions and we were waiting for this decision. So the decision has been monumentally important for these guys. Um, it's not, the final orders haven't been given, so the appeal period hasn't run. And we've got an undertaking from the department that they will not return anyone um, with similar circumstances until they determine how they're going to deal with the, whether they're going to appeal or how they're going to deal with the fallout of SZQRB. So it's a breathing space. But before we had that breathing space, we thought we had a really big fight on our hands, and I think we still do. A lot of these Hazaras come from Quetta. They have absolutely no contacts in Kabul whatsoever. And myself and another uh, member of the Refugee Council, Professor William Maley, who is an absolute world expert on Afghanistan, went back to Kabul. And Phil Glenn Denning, who is um, the head of the Edmund Rice Centre and wrote um, the Return to Danger report about the last time they returned Hazaras from Nauru in 2001 and what's happened to them. Um, he's going in another couple of weeks. So three members of the council will have been in Kabul um, to really look for ourselves to see what's going on. Um, what did I see? Afghanistan is an immensely, immensely complex place. 30 years, it's still, it's not even post-conflict, it's still conflict. Um, the number of returnees, because of sanctions, the effect of sanctions on Iran, they are aggressively um, deporting Hazaras. Um, there have been well over a million Hazaras in uh, Iran. Um, they've been very tolerant of them for many, many years, going back to even when the Soviets invaded. They're throwing them out. There are a lot of them in Herat now and in Mazar Sharif, um, places in just appalling conditions, and uh, they are also coming to Kabul. 
you have a lot of people coming in from the provinces because the security is so um, precarious in the provinces. So Kabul has exploded in population. And when you come in, you just see these um, mud huts going up the hillsides all around. Kabul is ringed by stunning mountains and they're just crawling up the hillsides. They're all illegal. Think of the favelas in Brazil. Um, they're, they're kind of Afghanistan's version of slums. Um, no sewerage, no water, no electricity. It is freezing in winter there and people are, are freezing, dying in winter. Um, the Karzai government is very reluctant to allow NGOs to service those areas because that will be seen as a draw factor for even more people to come in from the provinces. They want them to stay out. Infrastructure is not there. If you want to go four-wheel driving, you don't want to go to the country, go to Kabul. It is just unbelievable. It, the little bit of rain and the mud is that deep on major roads. Um, so I guess, you know, people are living in a very, very impoverished way. Are Hazaras walking around the street having a gun pointed at them? No, they're not. Um, but there is an enormous amount of discrimination. If you come back and you have no contacts in that city because it is such a deeply familial place and governed by your relationships with everyone else, you will get about six weeks transitionary accommodation with IOM, the International Office of Migration, and then you're on your own. And to try, the land situation is diabolical in Kabul. Rent stress is huge. Uh, poverty is endemic. There are just disabled people everywhere. Widows in burqas on the ground still begging. All this sort of stuff is happening. Um, whereas there was an enormous um, whole employment machine around the ISAF and NATO commitment in Afghanistan, that's all being scaled down now. And so jobs that might have gone with all those big NGOs and the military you know, complex there, it's massive, um, are shrinking very quickly. Unemployment is going up. The economy is collapsing because what we're having is a presidential election which absolutely no one has any confidence in it having a successful outcome, coinciding with the withdrawal of troops. And the withdrawal of troops means the withdrawal of many, many aid projects and groups. And that, that just equals economic collapse. Why they time these things together is beyond me. And it's now beyond me to understand why a country who went into Afghanistan in 2001 to assist and has been militarily engaged since would think that it's helping by sending back failed asylum seekers at a point in time when they can't even care for their own. And there is no guarantee that this country is not going to fall into major civil war uh, either with or falling uh, very soon after the next presidential election. So I guess um, the position of the Refugee Council will be formalised um, before long that there should be a moratorium on any failed asylum seekers being returned to Afghanistan. But prior to that, all those legacy cases that were subjected to this unlawful ITOA process, which SZQRB has unpacked and exposed for what it was, and I have to say, we told them, beforehand, this is wrong, this has, this has got no semblance of a lawful process and they ignored us. Um, all those cases, it is our position that they must be fed back in and dealt with properly before the Refugee Review Tribunal. Um, there's been no undertaking that that will occur. So I should wind up now to let other speakers have a go. Um, and I just have, if anybody's interested at the end, brought back some slides and whatnot from Kabul, which I'm happy to show if anybody wants to stay. Thanks. Thank you, Sonia. And thank you to all the brilliant work that you do and our panel of speakers do on all of these important issues. Um, I thought it was um, worth mentioning about five weeks ago you may have seen that 30 Afghani MPs wrote to the Australian Government urging them not to return any um, you know, failed asylum seekers because they don't have the capacity to protect them. And I thought you know, that, that was really interesting and coincided with this aggressive clean-up that the Department was doing through Melbourne and Sydney of um, failed asylum seekers putting them back into detention um, as a you know, readying for for the returns and probably are waiting for the outcome of, of SZQRB. Um, if you, you're all not aware, very excitingly, there is um, 
a constitutional challenge that's been filed against the um, uh, detention on Nauru, and um, it, that'll be a very interesting case, and certainly the legislative scheme on Nauru and how it intersects with Australia is, is, is very interesting. So Julian Burnside is heading that up um, with Shine Lawyers, as I understand. And um, it was also revealed last night that the opposition in uh, Papua New Guinea is launching a Supreme Court uh, challenge to the Manus Island uh, detention centres. Um, and I thought it was interesting in SCQRB, or, or kind of symbolic, that there were, th I, I think there was two or three uh, typos where instead of saying that this uh, SCQRB was Hazara Afghani, it was Sri Lankan. Because Sri Lanka, and, and there's a courage element and, and those corrections, and it's, it's probably not a difficult mistake to make at the moment because, you know, the issue with returning Tamils is, is equally as troubling, and certainly with the human rights watch report coming out about widespread systematic torture and rape and all those kinds of issues. And then with all these Commonwealth governments saying, oh, you know, there's no problem, um, it, you know, there's nothing going on. Um, Australian Lawyers for Human Rights and a whole range of other organisations are having a, um, a seminar on Sri Lanka and the rule of law on the 19th of June. But it's interesting that through this web that we create to kind of keep asylum seekers out as best we can, a couple of weeks ago, a boatload of Sri Lankans got through and landed in Geraldton, only in West Australia. Now there's this whole idea of a screening out process. And I thought that our next speaker might also be able to talk to us a little bit about that because it's equally as kind of labyrinthine or Wellian as everything else seems to be in the, um, in the act. So uh, Angus Francis, or Dr Angus Francis as I like to call him, he doesn't seem to like the doctor, but I certainly think we need a doctor of law to heal the ills of um, asylum seeker policy in, um, in Australia. And um, I, I, I am a dad, so I get away with that joke. Um, <laughs> Angus Francis is the principal solicitor at the Refugee and Immigration Legal Service in Brisbane and is also an adjunct associate professor at the QUT Faculty of Law. Uh, previously, he taught at QUT and two other Australian law schools. And before that, he's practised as a solicitor uh, with Mallison. He com completed his doctoral thesis at ANU on the subject of uh, the role of legislative, executive and judicial mechanisms in ensuring a fair and effective asylum process. And he's extremely busy at the moment, but um, we thank you for coming along. Please come around. Firstly, thanks uh, to the hosts for putting this on. Uh, it's great to see everyone here. Uh, very enthusiastic to see so many people interested in this issue. Uh, Rails uh, Refugee and Immigration Legal Service is an independent legal service based in West End, Brisbane. Uh, we provide uh, advice to immigrants and refugees. Uh, we've got uh, three major areas that we specialise in. Uh, the first is uh, applications under the Domestic Violence Provisions of the Migration Act. Those are for um, uh, women usually who come across on provisional partner visas and then are subject to domestic violence and then we put in an application for them to have permanent residency despite the fact that the uh, uh, relationship has ended. Uh, in addition, we have another caseload uh, in refugee family reunion. Uh, that's where refugees uh, arrive in Australia and then apply to bring their family over from uh, countries uh, in Africa usually. Uh, or in Asia. Um, we also then have another caseload which I'll be talking about tonight which is the protection visa caseload. Most of our clients will arrive in Australia on tourist or student visas and then put in an application for a protection visa. They will come and see us, uh, we will interview them, we will determine whether they have a claim uh, in our view, uh, we will then assist them to draft a statement which sets out their story, their life story, why they fear going back to their country of origin. Uh, it's an important part of the legal process because under the Refugee Convention, to be a refugee, you have to have a well-founded fear of persecution. A well-founded fear is both a subjective fear, so you personally have to fear persecution. So that's where we take the statement of the client. Uh, and then also we um, have volunteers and caseworkers who then do country information research compare that statement to what's actually happening in the country of origin and so then support the, uh, the client's statement with a legal submission that details what's happening in the country of origin and why that is consistent with the, uh, the client's statement. We put that to the Department of Immigration 
who are either grant protection visa or do not. If they do not, uh, it then goes to the Refugee Review Tribunal. Uh, the Refugee Review Tribunal is an independent tribunal. It's got very experienced members. It's got set procedures. Uh, and we again will take a further statement if necessary from the client. Uh, we'll provide that to the tribunal along with a further legal submission. And I can see a number of volunteers, legal um, uh, volunteers in the audience who assist with those sorts of tasks. That's the, that's the process for uh, people who come by plane and want to apply for a protection visa. It's a fairly straightforward process. Uh, the law behind it can be complex uh, and so legal representation is required. There is a body of law uh, that deals with the definition of refugee under the Refugee Convention and also a growing body of law, as we heard Sonia talk about, in the area of complementary protection. So that is protection under other international treaties such as the ICCPR or the Convention Against Torture. So it's a, a complex task to prepare an application. It has to be prepared with a lot of thought. Uh, there can be legal research that goes into um, citing high court authorities, federal court authorities, which prove that your client may or may not fit the definition of a refugee uh, under the Convention, uh, which has been partly incorporated into Australian law. The... Uh, the growing issue for us is the clients who we are seeing who come by boat. Uh, when I was a uh, law student, I spent some time up, um, I was a volunteer at what was then Spickles, the South Brisbane Immigration Community Legal Service, now Rails, and I was a migration agent and went up to Port Headland to work for um, the Refugee Council with uh, Sino-Vietnamese refugees coming down by boat. At that point, the process was the same as boat arrivals as for plane arrivals. They arrived, they were taken into detention. Uh, we interviewed them. Uh, we put the statements. The decision was made whether to grant them a protection visa. They had a right of appeal to the Refugee Review Tribunal and then, of course, a right of appeal to the courts on points of law. Uh, so the process was the same. Now, since the early 1990s, we've seen a gradual tightening up uh, and a gradual uh, restriction on the access of uh, boat people to that mainstream normal process. Uh, so, uh, it begins with, uh, in 2001, the arrival of the uh, MV Tampa and the uh, refugees on the MV Tampa. Uh, the government, under the Howard uh, uh, administration, uh, took steps to expel those refugees uh, from Australia uh, and to send them to Nauru and Manus Island and also some were taken by New Zealand. Uh, the, the purpose was to act as a deterrent on future arrivals. Uh, the, um, the legislative amendments that accompanied that policy change uh, were introduced in 2001, in September 2001. Those changes were profound because they allowed for people who arrived by boat to be taken to a declared country under Section 198A of the then Migration Act. Uh, that allowed the Minister for uh, Immigration to declare a certain country to be a safe country to take a refugee and to process them there. The uh, then Minister for Immigration uh, declared Nauru and uh, Papua New Guinea after the first refugees had been taken there. Uh, that didn't seem to worry the government at the time. And uh, that introduced offshore processing. So that was the genesis of it. Uh, the intention was to restrict um, access to Australia, to restrict access to the Australian courts. Uh, and since that time we've seen uh, a steady uh, decline in the access of boat people to the normal process. For our clients, uh, what that means is that today, if you arrive, let's say, from Sri Lanka and you arrive in uh, Christmas Island, you are first subject to what they call a um, screening process. So forget everything I just said. The screening process is an invention of uh, administrative policy. It has no roots in the Migration Act or any legislative basis whatsoever. The DAC officer will interview our client and will say, OK, tell me why you came to Australia. Uh, 
It's called an entry interview. They fill in a pro forma form and they uh, go through a series of questions which try to elicit the true reason why the person has come to Australia and why they came uh, and how they came to Australia. The uh, client at that time has no legal representation. They haven't seen a lawyer. They're probably only a day or two off the boat. So they're dehydrated, fatigued, uh, disorientated. A lot of them will never have had an interview with an official before. Many of them will associate officials with uh, the reason why they uh, fled persecution in the first place. So they're confronted by you know, two very big migration officials, probably, and they are asked a series of questions. What they say in that entry interview will then uh, be held against them from then on in the protection visa application process, assuming they can get into it. But we're still at the screening process. If the department decides that those people don't raise issues of protection, then the department's policy at the moment is that they can remove those people without any legal assistance, without any legal advice, and remove them to their country of origin. Remove them to Sri Lanka. This is occurring now for clients who even arrived uh, six or seven months ago and are now in the community in Brisbane. We're seeing clients now in our office we have had no access to a legal advisor for that entire time. They just happen to be uh, referred to us by uh, community support workers, and many are here today from organisations like MDA, Red Cross, Access, who are involved in the, uh, the care of those clients. Uh, they refer the client to us. It's a very arbitrary process. Um, and they then see us, and we go, OK, what's happened? Well, I haven't seen a lawyer. They're telling me they're going to remove me in two weeks' time. You know, these people have got no idea what's going on. We uh, are then uh, given the opportunity, if we're lucky, of putting a statement on behalf of the client to the department, who will then say, well, maybe, maybe not, we'll screen them in. Um, what are our rights? What are the client's rights? A couple of these have been taken to court, but it's still very unclear because the court uh, process has never run through. The department concedes uh, before this actually gets to uh, trial. So we don't really know what the legal position is, whether or not the minister can be forced, in fact, to allow them to apply somehow for a protection visa. So that's the first step. So even before we get to the protection visa application process, there's the screening process. And you may have seen in the media many boats uh, of Sri Lankans have been returned straight to Sri Lanka. The Australian government says, well, there's nothing to fear because uh, we've been assured that the returnees to Sri Lanka are treated well and uh, our officials there will be in on the uh, interviews that are held at the airport and we'll keep an eye on them while they're there. Now that fundamentally misunderstands the concept of asylum. The concept of asylum is if you go from one country to another, you are seeking protection in the other country because that other country cannot protect you in your own. Let's say a Sri Lankan asylum seeker is sent back and is persecuted. What is the Australian government going to do about it? Nothing. They can't do anything because that person is now under the sovereign control of Sri Lanka. That is the whole point of asylum, which seems to be uh, willfully misunderstood by the current, uh, current government. So that's the pre-screening process. They call, it, they call what happened to the, the, the Sri Lankans the enhanced screening process because an official in Canberra ticks off on it. So that's the enhanced screening process that we had a big lecture about by DA. So that's excellent. So that's the, that's the pre-screening process. Um, the, the next hurdle that our clients are facing is that for those people who arrived post-13 August last year, they are subject to a new regime. Uh, they can be taken to an offshore processing country, Nauru or Manus, or they can be kept in Australia and put it into um, community detention, which is... Uh, technically known under the Migration Act as an alternative residence determination where the Minister can declare that a person could live in the community but still be in detention, or they're on bridging visas, which are temporary visas that allow them to stay lawfully in the country uh, whilst, well, whilst what? They're waiting for something. Those clients are subject, as I said, to removal to an offshore processing country at any time. At this point, no processing has started uh, in Australia for that cohort. 
there have been over 13,000 arrivals since uh, the post-13 August changes. Uh, so we're talking about huge numbers now in the community just sitting there. So we have uh, clients who have relatives, who have partners, who have husbands, wives, here in Australia on permanent visas, so they've come before their family, but here on permanent visas, who now uh, are seeing the, uh, the chance that their, that their wife and daughters may be taken to, to Nauru or Manus Island at, at a moment's notice. Um, so that's, that's the other hurdle. Uh, in addition to that, for those clients who are unlucky enough to have been sent to Nauru uh, or Manus Island, the situation is this. On Manus, there has been no, no processing uh, at this point. On, on Nauru, processing has commenced. Um, there are two providers, uh, both private providers, who are being contracted by the Department of Immigration to provide legal assistance in an application process under Nauruan law. So it's under Nauruan law. Uh, there are no rights of appeal to any Australian courts from the decisions made on as far as uh, the department is concerned, the Department of Immigration is concerned. The lawyers might have another view. Uh, and uh, there is no outcome. So it's an application process with no outcome. So if they, if they are recognised as refugees, uh, Nauru is not going to take them. Uh, Australia has said, well, we may or may not take them. Uh, and so then the question is, well, what other countries will resettle them, will take them as refugees from Nauru? Because Nauru has said that the arrangement is temporary. The, uh, the issue is complicated by the department's uh, position that, the government's position that there is a no advantage principle. The no advantage principle is based on the idea that people who arrive by boat shouldn't have any better a chance of getting a protection visa than those who go through the normal routes and get an offshore humanitarian visa to come to Australia. So that, according to the government, involves some kind of uh, lineal uh, time frame. So is it three years? Is it five years? Do you have to wait before you get your visa? Who knows? The, the clients that we have, we have got clients on the room, have been told that uh, they could be there for years. They could be there for years. So they've been living in tents now for, or we were living in tents for seven or eight months. They could be there for years uh, without any guarantee, even getting resettled. We have um, also got clients who then are brought from, from Nauru uh, and Manus to Australia uh, under provisions that were introduced uh, under the Howard government to allow what they call uh, transitory persons to come to Australia for medical treatment and then be returned to an offshore processing place. Um, you wouldn't know, but Tuong Private Hospital and the Brisbane Immigration Transit Accommodation at Pinkin Bar, our detention centre, is the route of preference for those clients, for those uh, transitory persons. So there probably are about uh, five or six currently at either the Tuong Private Hospital or BITA being held there after their uh, hunger strikes or self-harm, attempted suicides, uh, and are now subject to being removed back to Nauru uh, and uh, or Manus Island. Those clients are in a tough position um, because legally the powers under the Migration Act which allow their removal abroad, uh, Daryl and uh, Sonia have talked about the breadth of the Ministry of Discretion given to the Minister under the Migration Act, the same, the same uh, kind of rules apply to the, the removal powers to offshore processing places for transitory persons and others. So it's very difficult to see uh, on what basis we can, we can challenge them. Uh, we are currently uh, getting um, some assistance from a law firm to find out uh, more about uh, their rights, um, but it's uh, early days yet. So whether we can challenge their removal is, uh, is up for grabs at this point. The um, situation for those who are taken back to Nauru, who have been taken back to Nauru, is pretty dire. I mean, they're really, really shot mentally. Um, you know, they've got not much hope of anything getting much uh, better. Um, they're still detained in what they see as prison conditions. They associate uh, those prison conditions with what they escape from. 
They can't understand why they fled, free, fled for freedom in Australia and have been locked up on an atoll 5,000 kilometres from anywhere. Um, and, you know, they really, really struggle with it. Uh, and, you know, and they're educated um, and they have a deep objection to how they're treated. And they will protest. And the, the reaction of the uh, authorities is to then charge them for, uh, for rioting under the Queensland Criminal Code, which applies in uh, Nauru. <laughs> so we now have the situation where Jay Williams, a barrister who, who, um, who, uh, who got himself up there with the help of the New South Wales Bar Association, no thanks to Australian authorities, got himself up there, um, pro bono represented um, the Nauru 10, they're called, including one of our clients, um, and uh, managed to get the uh, the writ for habeas corpus uh, put in, despite attempts to prevent him from getting up there uh, to Nauru. Uh, so, you know, he's done wonders. Um, he's now got a, a sort of like a dream team to help him, with barristers. Um, but it's, you know, it's up for grabs there whether they'll be successful. Because previous um, appeals to the Nauru Supreme Court um, have been unsuccessful under the habeas jurisdiction. Uh, that was under the previous uh, arrangements under the Howard government. They were unsuccessful. And then by quirk of colonial history, um, the Australian High Court is in fact the Privy Council, in effect, for the Nauru Supreme Court. So the Nauru Supreme Court is constituted by, or was at the time, constituted by a barrister from Melbourne who, lived, who was two floors down from Julian Burnside, um, who, was the, who was the QC who was running the, running the matter. And um, the uh, legislation that was introduced after Australia gave up Nauru uh, as a territory uh, allowed for the Australian High Court to be the final court of appeal for the Nauru Supreme Court. So, I ran away, and then I went up to the <laughs> Australian High Court, and the Australian High Court, uh, with Kirby dissenting, this was back in 2005, said, oh, uh, no, it's lawful to detain under the uh, Nauru uh, Constitution, and so it was not a uh, infringement of the Nauru Constitution. Now, I don't know what they're going to try and argue this time. I hope they get up, uh, but I'm, I'm, not, uh, I'm not too hopeful. Uh, the, um, the other aspect to it is that we, we will be uh, lodging a complaint to the UN Human Rights Committee on behalf of our, our client who's been taken back there, um, both because um, of the conditions of detention on Nauru and the treatment of uh, that client, but also because we were not notified before his removal, contrary to uh, departmental policy on, on removals. Uh, he has not also had any access to legal advice in his time up there. We have been denied access by the Department of Immigration who refuses to facilitate our access to our client, despite our um, express authority to act on his behalf. And he's signed authority uh, to act on his behalf. Um, the, the other aspect to that is that um, the Australian government has uh, refused to fund any public defence, any uh, defence of the Nauru 10 for those, uh, for those uh, alleged defences on Nauru. Now this is grave because without, without defence, of course, the chances of conviction are higher and if you are convicted of a criminal offence, apart from the penalties under the Queensland Criminal Code, which are severe, as the law students can attest it, um, but the, uh, the chances of you then getting a visa to go anywhere if you have a criminal conviction are zero. So you're almost guaranteed to be sent back to your country of origin. The, um, the government has responded to, I'm also a member of the Migration Law Committee of the, of the Law Council, Australian Law Council, and um, we had a round table uh, which was held by the Human Rights Council down in uh, Sydney. We sent, we both sent letters um, to, the, to the Minister and uh, those letters have come back uh, with the response that the criminal offences are under Nauruan law, uh, the uh, arrangements uh, are the responsibility of Nauru and the um, funding of any legal defence is the responsibility of the Nauruan government. Now this is despite the fact that Nauru is impoverished, they do not have uh, an a, a, uh, existing legal uh, infrastructure. Um, the, to give you an idea, the Solicitor General uh, 
is also acting as the public defender. So um, for law students that look, they would know that's kind of a conflict. Um, it's a bit like, you know, I don't know, like Batman and Joker coming together. Now, um, the, the uh, position then is that uh, without, without uh, the goodwill of the bar associations in Australia and the fact that Jay Williams was able to get himself a ticket to go up there on his own dosh, uh, the, uh, the Nauru tent had no, had no defence. There are no lawyers on Nauru to defend them. So the situation is dire for them. So I'm just gra grateful to hear that um, you know, you've got people like Jay Williams who are able to put their, put their money where their mouth is and then go up there and, and uh, defend them. But it's still not ideal. That, uh, you know, uh, really sort of concludes what I wanted to say. I mean, there are, there's just so many hurdles now for people to even get to the protection visa application process uh, for those people who arrive by boat. And we are seeing more and more people coming into our service uh, where before we were just traditionally, yes, we put in our application for protection visas, we're now a service which is not that well resourced, which has to grapple with really profound and complex issues and we have to advocate, we have to be you know, going to the department, cap in hand times, just to get our clients to the point where they can put in a protection claim. And that just seems to me to be wrong and uh, overly complex. So uh, I'm very happy to see so many people here today. And I'm glad I didn't relapse into any tax law because this is where I did my tax law lectures. <laughs> and I fell asleep around there with Oliver sitting out in the back there. <laughs> okay, thanks. Angus, uh, you certainly haven't lost the knack of a uh, university lecturer. Um, I, um, our next speaker is our only non-lawyer of the evening, um, which, which is exciting and good to give balance to the uh, panel. And afterwards we will, we're probably running a bit over time, but we've got the room for a while, so as long as people want to um, keep the discussion going, that's fine. And um, after Tracy finishes, I'll invite the panel to come and sit up here. Now, um, I think Tracy's got a PowerPoint. Yes. I don't know where the is, but the laptop. Right. <laughs> ah, there's MJ coming down. So, um, Tracy Worrell has been the director of the Queensland Program of Assistance to Survivors of Torture and Trauma since 2007, or as it's known as uh, CUPSAT. CUPAS. CUPAS is one of eight specialist agencies across Australia working with refugee survivors of torture and trauma. QPAR sees 2,500 clients from approximately 60 different ethnic groups each year, including asylum seekers, new arrivals and people who have been in Australia for many years. The service has a presence across Queensland, including Weeper, Cairns, Townsville, Rockhampton, Toowoomba, Logan and Brisbane. Tracy has worked in the community service sector for over 30 years across a range of roles from direct service delivery to management. Her current role enables her to mix passion for social justice her interest in refugee and asylum seeker issues and her interest in the management of community-based organisations. Please give her a warm welcome. Hi everyone. Um, I guess I'd just like to thank you for coming. It's a great crowd. I want to acknowledge a couple of people just before I start because there's a couple of QPAS staff here who have more information and more to, I suppose, value add if anyone's interested afterwards. The first is Catherine, who's the leader of our Cyber from Seeker Support Team, and the other is Fernanda, who is uh, leads our capacity building and training functions at QPAS, and both work with asylum seekers every day. So um, I'd just like to acknowledge them, and later perhaps when there are questions, if people are interested, they are here. I'd also like to acknowledge that there are a number of service providers that we work very closely with here, and so some of the information that I'll be going through tonight is not perhaps new to them, so apologies for that. Um, but I just thought, it, the reason I bought a PowerPoint, even though PowerPoint's not always very popular, is I just wanted to share some statistics and some other things with people. I also just wanted to mention that I don't know how many people would have seen Four Corners last night. Um, it was mentioned earlier that it's worth watching, and perhaps it is. It's a bit depressing. Um, and in fact, you know, it was the sort of thing afterwards I wish I hadn't watched before I went to bed. Um, but there's probably not a lot extra. I can actually add if you saw that last night. In fact, the show last night probably depicts very well 
um, the frustrations of people and the feelings of people who are held in detention. What I've been asked to do tonight is to look at some of the damage long-term detention does to people. Um, so on one side we've got the legal processes that people need to go through and they take time and, the, and we have a, a system in Australia which is keeping people for increasing times in detention. So I'm just briefly going to go through that. Just to let people know, if you haven't had contact, so people are perhaps more connected with the legal system, if you haven't had contact with us, we're a member of what's called the Forum for Australian Services for Survivors of Torture and Trauma. There are eight of us across Australia, so there's one in each state and territory. We're community-based, not-for-profit organisations, and we offer a range of services to people who are either from refugee background or have had a refugee-like experience, um, and we only work with people who have had those experiences and have experienced torture and trauma prior to arrival in Australia. Um, we, as part of that, we provide services to people who are seeking asylum in Australia. And they may be in detention, so we work with people in detention centres, they may be in community detention, or they may be in the community. So I just thought, firstly, some statistics, and I'm not sure how many people are aware of the current statistics. I'm going to take no responsibility for the accuracy of these statistics, they're from DIAC, so you can believe them or not. But as of the end of February, there were 5,750 people in immigration detention, and that included 4,523 in detention centres on the Australian mainland, and 1,224 on Christmas Island. So that was predominantly the makeup. In Queensland, um, Angus mentioned earlier that we have the Biter, but we also have Shergill, which is just outside of Weeper. So we have two detention centres in Queensland. There were also approximately 420 men on Nauru and 270 people on Manus, including approximately 30 children. In addition, as of March this year, there were 2,800 people in community detention. So they are the people who are being held in the community but don't have a lawful visa. And that included 1,250 children, which is actually a substantial number of children. As of March 2013, there were also 9,600 people on bridging visas, with 4,200 of those having arrived since August 2012. And August 2012 is actually a critical point, as Angus mentioned. A, legally, it puts them into a different process, but also those people have no work rights. And so at the moment, they're being held in the community without work rights. These are the nationalities of people currently in our um, detention system. So it, the highest percentage is Sri Lankan, mostly Tamil, so about 35%, followed by Iran, then by Afghanistan, then a number of countries sitting on about 4%. Um, and the other is a mix of people from Burma, mostly Rohingya, China and Vietnam. And in fact, people may have heard in the papers, we've had our first boat arrivals from Vietnam in about 30 years. Um, nationalities in community um, determination or community detention around Sri Lanka and Afghanistan uh, tend to be the number. So that's just to give people some quick um, statistics. So what do we know? So we know as a um, service that provides support to people who have experienced torture and trauma that we need to consider the whole of the person in any of the work that we do. So we need to consider the life that they've had before they sought asylum. We need to consider the trauma or the torture they've experienced as part of their journey and we need to take into account the process that they're undergoing since arrival in Australia. For some of the people that includes a settlement process that we work with, but the people we're talking about tonight that includes a detention process. The people that we work with, they experience the things that we see on the left hand side. Is the left hand side? <laughs> left hand side. So people have experienced the sorts of incidences that we're talking about there, and that's the impact that it has on, the, on people who've experienced those. So people who've experienced threats to life, they often internalise threats um, as anxiety, they have feelings of helplessness and they have a loss of control, etc. So what we have is quite um, a series of reactive effects in terms of people's psychological health um, caused, by the concept, caused by the experiences that people have had. And if people are interested, we can give people this information in more detail. That's impacted then for people in detention by the actual detention centre environment. So the detention centre environment is characterised by a number of things. The fir first of all, it's characterised by confinement and deprivation. So it's not a pleasant environment. 
It's characterised by loss of liberty and loss of control. People don't have control over what they do with their lives. And sometimes people take whatever control they can, and that might be suicide, for example. That might be the only aspect of control people have. Or it might be that they refuse to wake up in the morning, they refuse to get up in the morning. And people say to us, they're not getting up to have breakfast, or they're refusing to get up, they're sleeping through till 2 o'clock in the afternoon. That might be the only aspect of control someone has in their life. It's a prison-like and it's a punitive atmosphere. People are treated as though they're um, prisoners and in many cases they're treated like criminals. The tedium and restrictive routine. Now that's ever present in a detention centre and that includes a complete dearth of meaningful activity for people. They literally have nothing to do all day. If they're lucky they might get um, access to the internet for maybe an hour if there's enough internet and they've got that access. They literally have nothing to do all day. There's a lack of privacy. People, for example, in Nauru and Manus, they're in tents. And there's lots of people in tents. There's a lack of opportunities for communication with people outside, including families. They're isolated. Nearly all our detention centres are in extremely isolated sites. So one in, at Weepa, that's almost the most isolated you can get in Australia. You have to travel to Cairns and then have to wait for sometimes a day to get a flight to Weeper, which is a two-hour flight from Cairns. You then have to drive for nearly an hour from Weeper on a dirt road to get to the detention centre. Being subject to declining mental health and disturbing activities of others. So it's not your own, only your own mental health or your own well-being you need to look after. It's the fact that everyone in your environment is also suffering and sometimes, and people are witnessing and sometimes seeing things that are really unpleasant um, in terms of behaviours of other people. Um, because seeing someone else so their lips together because they're frustrated isn't, it's not a pleasant thing to have to see any day. This is added to by the feelings that people have. So the perceived injustice and inhumanity in the face of doing nothing wrong. People are really frustrated about that when they're in detention. They're not criminals, they haven't done anything wrong. They've actually fled abuse and yet they're being treated like this. So there's a real sense of injustice and inhumanity. Powerlessness and disenfranchisement, really evident in detention centres. They feel very vulnerable to the whims of others. Now that might be the immigration officer who does the screening process. Um, I can remember a client at um, BITA several years ago saying they knew they were going to get a negative and they knew they were going to get a negative because the person who interviewed them interviewed all these other people and they all got negatives. So they knew that the person who did the interviews gave negatives. That's not how a process should work. Um, and the perceived unfairness, particularly about the processing. So why have I gone to Nauru and someone else got community detention and in fact got to work? In this What's fair about that? Um, why is that um, every other person on the boat I came on got a visa but I haven't and I still haven't after three years? No explanation. Where's the fairness around that sort of process? So that in turn leads to these sort of outcomes. Isolation and alienation loss of family and of course loss of relationships. If someone spends three years in a detention pathway in Australia and then they seek for their family to come over and that might take another five or six years, you're talking up to ten years separation from family. That leads of course to breakdowns in relationships, even if you're still well enough to actually be able to maintain good relationships. Increasing hopelessness and demoralisation. Increasing fatigue and loss of vitality with reduced capacity to act purposely. So people actually just get more and more tired and more and more depressed and actually can't actually do anything. Increased cognitive impairment. I've actually written particularly memory and concentration. That's really important in terms of a legal process because if you're working with someone who's experienced torture to start with, they've had an incredibly traumatic journey and they've now been in detention, that actually may not be possible it may not be possible for them to remember parts of their trip or parts of their history. It often presents as though they've lied because they'll remember different bits of different aspects. And so we'll often get feedback that in fact, oh, that person has made things up because their story this time is different to last time. But that's in fact an impact of what they've been through. Initially, when people are arrived by boat, they actually have feelings of relief and hope. So that's very quickly replaced by fear and anxiety and tension, chronic anxiety, depression or psychosis. Personality change, 
We know from the research that many people have been through a long detention pathway have quite dramatic changes in personality. So the research that, that looks at people after they've been resettled into the community. They have poor general mental health and the severity of symptoms increases with the length of time spent in the detention environment. We know that. We know that the longer someone spends in a detention environment, the poorer the mental health outcomes are. And for us as a community, that's a real worry because most people end up as citizens of Australia and we've given them a mental health condition. So the research that is um, around and our experience tells us that there's enduring harm to asylum seekers who've been detained for long periods. It's damaging to them, so damaging to the cell. It's damaging to their relationships and their capacity to have long-term relationships and to hold on to the relationships they have. It damages people's core values. So people often come with a real sense of justice and injustice and, and belief in humanity. It damages those values and, of course, damage their mental health. So in short, this is our, my formula for the night. The loss of autonomy coupled with uncertainty added to perceived unfairness and indefinite time periods plus concerns about family and loved ones multiplied by time in detention equals poor mental health outcomes along with broader life impacts such as changed relationships. So in fact what we have is a series of impacts that actually multiply by each other and multiply by length of time in detention. <coughs> And so what we have is one impacting on another, impacting on another, and the time anyone spends in detention multiplies a lot. In our experience, we have no research and no experience to suggest that very short-term detention by itself um, is problematic for mental health. So, for example, if someone was held for two to six weeks to do health checks, we have no evidence at the moment that that is psychologically damaging. Um, however, long-term detention we know is incredibly damaging. And so I guess that for us is one of the critical things and that is really played out and we see that played out in people's legal processes because with each legal step that hopelessness actually increases. So each time they're rejected or each time something happens, we in fact see that deterioration. And I guess I just wanted to say before I finish, not to forget, um, we've mostly been talking about people in detention and people are actually in held detention, and we know that's very damaging. But we are actually seeing similar people and similar effects on people who are living in the community on bridging visas. So we know that it's not just the actual concept of held detention, although of course the loss of autonomy and freedom has an impact, we know that. But if people are even in the community without certainty, and so we know that they're processed over three, five years and they don't know where their life is, they don't know if they're going to be able to stay, they're still worried about family and friends back home, that in fact that time period also multiplies for those people. And equally we know that we're, and we're seeing poor mental health outcomes for people who are living in the community. So while one of the solutions has been, oh, we'll put people in the community, it's actually that time impact still has that, in, still has that result. And I guess the other thing that we see, and I, as a service which works across both people who come through a detention pathway or an asylum seeker pathway, and people who come from a humanitarian visa pathway, we need to not forget that so also do some of these impacts occur on people who are in camps, sometimes in appalling conditions, for three or four generations. So all of those impacts happen on people in camps too. And so people coming through a humanitarian process may also have some of those impacts. And finally, I just wanted to leave you with a learning cartoon, which some of you may have seen before, which I just think learning has an infinite capacity to pick two things. And so one is the way that life is supposed to be and that we want it to be, and the other is the way that life actually is. And that's so much the way for so many people.
to many of the workers in this horrible system that's doing that damage. But what's the damage to our society? When I was a public servant, we used to have to do social impact statements for any legislation and programs that we're introducing. And yet we have created a system which is fundamentally damaging our whole society. Comments, please.
um, and are fleeing to find durable safety. I guess I think that, that there's also lots of different impacts. So I think there's the impact about us as a humane society and what that says about us. I think that there's the impact in terms of the political debate and what that says about running things, that the, the deep divisions that are being caused by the political debate and the divisions between having probably one of the world's best humanitarian settlement programs and one of the world's worst asylum seeker programs. So those sort of divisions. And then I think that there's also the cost to society in terms of what that means for future citizens and what that means in terms of the programs and the type of settlement outcomes people have. So I guess I think that there's a range of different. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, law students come from UQ, Griffith, QUT, uh, and they do 
a range of work. They do legal submission drafting. They do they sit in on interviews with clients. They help prepare statements. Um, they get to go to the Department of Immigration uh, with clients to lodge documents. So there's a range of things that they can help with. Uh, country information research. So yeah, it'd be great to have you. Yeah. This, this was actually a cunning plan for mass recruitment. <laughs> Just by the look of you, we could certainly like forge a law firm out of this group and, and, and take on the world. But, but certainly, um, I, I guess limiting to, the, to, to this area of community legal centres and um, is um, obviously funding and resources. So I again um, will encourage you to make a donation um, for tonight, and I would suggest ten or twenty dollars. You can make a donation online at Rails um, website. And certainly um, for the Refugee Council or Australian Lawyers for Human Rights, our website's still stuck back in the 1920s, but you can talk to me um, about that if you're interested. Now, there was a question in the blue, uh, sorry, in the pink in front of the, and the blue card in the next. Yeah. Um, just, um, you know, in light of all the government's distancing measures, um, you know, what Worse. <laughs> uh, you know, I'm thinking lack of access to work rights and um, the increasing reliance on community groups and this idea of you know continually renewing bridging visas, which was a bit similar to having to you know, go again to the immigration department and say yes, I still am open protection. And I'm just wondering from your own interactions with asylum seekers, what are you seeing, you know, from a mental health perspective and also in your other interactions? Is that comparison warranted? Even I mean, I guess the biggest issue for me, and in fact the opposition has actually stated they'll bring back temporary protection visas. Um, and the biggest difference for me is the chance of hope. So with a temporary protection visa, you actually don't have the right to apply for a permanent um, visa. So that's actually the major difference I see in terms of mental health outcomes between temporary protection visas and bridging visas or other forms of detention. That under a temporary protection visa, you have no chance to apply. Um, for permanent residency. However, there are some other aspects of the bridging visa components that are certainly damaging. No work rights. It means that people are really trapped into no meaningful activity and people really want to work. Um, however, can I, can I also say if people are very vulnerable, they're actually better... They, I'd have to say, our experience would say, they're better off not on a bridging visa. They're actually better off in community detention because they actually get more supports in community detention than they get on a bridging visa. So on a bridging visa you get reduced welfare allowance and you're essentially on your own, really, after a certain period of support. So, in fact, if in set, someone's highly vulnerable from the health protection, we'd always recommend they actually are on community detention. I don't know if that answers your question. but. <laughs> I, I, I was just going to say, I think, and there's probably been studies done about, sorry, your question from before about the long-term impacts, but even just in a very limited economic context. And as the President of the Human Rights Commission said last night, like if you take mor morality, ethics and even law out of it and you just look at the economics, yeah. the $2.3 billion that offshore processing is going to cost in the next four years compared with $15 million uh, in 2009-2010 that was needed to fund community detention. It just makes absolutely no sense, um, no economic sense at all. Um, many, many hands, and I think I said the lady in the blue. Yeah. I'm just curious, what's the scenario with the fact that it's, you know, mental health and stuff, massive issue, and it's also, it's also causing a lot of political costs to, you know, political party, and a lot of the riots that comes about. How is it justified then that for 400 asylum seekers in the room, that there's only two doctors, two nurses, and one psychiatrist?
sorry. I understand that there are two Tamil doctors actually amongst the detainees in that cohort on. Uh, it's unacceptable, but I can't. Assuming that the client surveils are uh, not in a position to pay, then apart from the huge number of donations that are going to come in as a result of tonight, how is Wales funded? Uh, we are funded uh, through a combination of Commonwealth funding and state funding. Um, we get also specific project funding, uh, so we can apply to the Department of Immigration for specific funding, for example, for refugee family reunion clinics that we hold at uh, MVA and Access. Uh, so we've got a mixture of uh, funding, um, but um, uh, with the certain things, uh, it's a stretch because uh, our core funding really doesn't cover things like judicial review. So we, we are stretching our resources to meet the demand. Uh, unlike other states, um, our Queensland Legal Aid doesn't take any role in judicial review, um, and so that really falls on us then to be advising clients. And we have a good relationship with QPELCH, the Queensland Public Interest Law Clearinghouse, where we have a protocol with them, a referral protocol. And a lot of the private bar in, uh, in Brisbane uh, assists uh, by looking at cases, including Darrell. And so, you know, we, we, we rely a lot on the goodwill of the profession uh, in Queensland to get by.